Um, Chris, is, is this, isn't it true that commercial architecture, what you call real estate architecture, the history of the high rise, um, leases, towers, the works of Gropius, aren't they part of architectural culture too? Or is there a sense in which you're saying that there's a commercial architecture culture which is distinct, maybe connected to, but is distinct and separate from what you would describe uh, as the architectural culture of Schinkel and certain corpse works? Yeah, I, I, I would say they, they, they are separate uh, in a sense. And uh, of course, we, as you rightly pointed out, the work of Gropius, the work of Mies, uh, was also appropriated by by the true blind weeks, right? And made that into corporate architecture of the ESO. But I think we should not confuse uh, with the appropriation of needs by by SOM uh, in, in doing the corporate skyscraper versus let's say the means uh, of twenties, right? Of relooking at uh, this uh, of looking at technology space, universal space and so and so forth, and to bring that to its uh, beautiful conclusion in, in, in Seagram. And of course I think also uh, we have to look at uh, the design of the skyscraper here because you, you mentioned Mies uh, in, in context and I think Colin Rowe uh, wrote this uh, beautiful architecture about uh, the Chicago grid, or the Chicago high skyscraper, that the skyscraper in the 20s and 30s in America was completely commercial uh, in terms of the driving force that creates it. But at the same time, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the skyscraper is anything but commercial in Europe because of its context. So I think we need to make a distinction between Mies, SOM, and versus the skyscraper in, 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 uh, in America and, and in Europe in between. There's quite a significant implication in that because as we uh, apparently enter a world in which one of the aspects of globalisation and capital flows is the desire for heights right. uh, rather than horizontality. That distinction between those things surely becomes rather more muddied. Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's, if you like, an, an architectural culture of high-rise buildings which is developing in very interesting ways That's at right. the moment. That's right. To separate that off from, as it were, the history of proper architecture, yeah. um, isn't that the sort of mistake that in the West we made with Bannister Fletcher, where basically it was the history of European architecture with one or two chapters sure. about Asia thrown in for good measure. Sure. No, not at all. I think I did not make it, uh, did not say that uh, all high-rise architecture is co commercial in a sense. I just showed you an example in which, uh, at least we try, uh, it's, it, it's not driven by, by commercial forces. <coughs> the other thing, picking up on the Saskia Assassin's point about the way in which um, global finance kind of almost moves around the ether and then it lands at the moment it's landed in London which explains everything from our crazy house prices to our yeah. construction booms. Um, can architecture operate um, independently of this or should it be trying to make specific responses which either mitigate or oppose the impacts of these sorts of capital flows, or is that a matter that can only be left to politics? Um, no, I don't think. So. I think not necessarily. I don't think. So. I don't think so. And I think, in a sense, built architecture requires capital, obviously, and of course, right. But nevertheless, I also think that architecture also has a role, first and foremost, as a cultural and a political discourse. And in this realm, architecture is produced through its idea, through a critical uh, realm. And in which perhaps, uh, as a critique, this form of ideas may not be built tomorrow, may not be built by the system or, or that we find ourselves in, but certainly I think it will shape the way in which decision makers uh, would think about architecture and its funding, for instance, in 10, 15 years' time. Now, a final question is um, your reference to uh, the banality which derives from um, the striving for novelty, yes. uh, which I couldn't agree with you more. But I wonder where you, how you would make a distinction between novelty um, and innovation, which is, of course, you know, entirely the, the story of architectural culture in many ways. Yeah. Um, what's the dividing line, yeah. and is and why is it that? Um, that, that global capital flows yeah. would demand novelty rather than what we might call genuine innovation. Yeah, well, I, I would say, uh, in a sense, uh, some we see it a lot uh, with architects presenting to developers that the design is different. We want something different, but something different may not be innovative. 
it is just different because it is different. It looks different. And usually it is the looking different that is valued uh, in product differentiation. So in a sense, that, that there is actually very little innovation uh, to the high rise, right? In a sense, floor slabs are still repeated at every 3.5 to 3.6 meter for housing and 4.2 for, for offices. And in which the innovation is the way in which it twists, it, it bends. So I would say that is diff just difference for the sake of difference. So I, I make that distinction in, in a sense. Well, I think there's a marvellous uh, creed occur uh, for what we might think of as proper architecture, wherever it may be made. Uh, Chris Lee, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.